Okay, good morning. Two days after the 4th of July where everybody ate um, whatever they wanted, I hope. I did. And now we thought it would be great to welcome our great friend, Dr. Stephen Gundry, back to talk about his best-selling cookbook called The Plant Paradox Cookbook. A hundred delicious recipes to help you lose weight, heal your gut, and live lectin free and we uh first met when he wrote the best selling the plant paradox and i'm here uh, to talk to him because we talk a lot about how to have a long life a healthy life how to be clear thinking uh and how to make your body work for you in the most positive way not necessarily to be thin that's right. not why we're doing this but we're doing it so we can think clearly and be there for those that we love. So I think it's really good because I ate everything that you could possibly eat on the 4th of July. Um, and we were just beginning to say like, how do you eat those comfort foods that everybody loves uh, and still be healthy, still have a healthy gut? And you said, first and foremost, no corn. No corn. No corn, which is a disaster for me. No corn on the cob, no corn chips, no corn tortillas, no popcorn, no. No, we're not designed to eat corn. Okay. Corn is a very modern grain. And here's the scary thing. Okay. Uh, we're not designed to eat corn. Uh, okay. None of our ancestors ever had corn until 500 years ago when Columbus brought it back from the Americas. And mm -hmm. uh, we're not from America. We're from Africa, Asia, or Europe. And mm -hmm. so we're not from here. And we're not designed to eat corn. Now, there was an experiment done a few years ago that actually Sanjay Gupta uh -huh. participated in. And corn has a particular carbon atom that you can identify coming from corn. It's called C4. And they did hair analysis of the typical American, including Sanjay Gupta. And 70% of the carbon atoms in the typical American, including Dr. Gupta, were from corn. And we're not supposed to eat corn. Europeans, only 5% of Europeans have corn as a molecule in them. Okay, so you just got that, no corn. So you were Sorry. saying, I was saying what I liked about this book, uh, The Plant Paradox, very successful, but this actually makes what you advocate practical. You can go in and, as one of these questions says here exactly on chapter two, so what exactly can I eat? And there seems to be, Dr. Gundry, so much confusion uh, amongst people as to what they should eat. Should it be Mediterranean? Should it be plant-based? Should it be paleo? Should it be high protein? Uh, we seem to get something different every day. And you were just saying that you think the longevity um, lesson is kind of landing on people. People are now aware that perhaps what they eat are pot is potentially making them sick. So what exactly should we be eating other then we know what we shouldn't eat, i.e. corn. Well, you know, the Mediterranean diet is a good example to bring, bring up. And uh, there's a very famous researcher out of Sweden by the name of Stefan Lindeberg who has studied the effect of nutrition and diet on longevity, among other things. And one of the things that he observed is that everybody says, well, the Mediterranean diet has beans right. and whole grains, and that's really healthy. Right. Well, if you actually kind of tease out the healthy parts of the Mediterranean diet uh -huh. and the unhealthy parts, it turns out that the grains and beans are a negative aspect of the diet that's compensated for by all the olive oil, by the red wine and the fruits and vegetables, and in general the fish. And so you actually don't see the negative aspects because of all the positive aspects. Gotcha. And I like to remind people that in 1949, the president of the American Cancer Society mm -hmm. said in a statement that cigarette smoking has nothing to do with cancer. Oh my uh, goodness. Yeah, now how in the world <laughs> could the president of the American Cancer Society say this? Well, because <laughs> everybody smoked in those days. I mean, you know. Right. 80% of men, 70% of women. So <coughs> even you couldn't tease out the fact that smoking was really bad because everybody was doing it. And so what I've done with the plant paradox uh, is to look and tease out what cultures have been doing that maybe doesn't really tell you the, the whole so truth. So what is the whole truth? So I'll give you an example. The, you know, I was a professor in one of the blue zones, Loma right. Linda. Mm -hmm. And so I've studied blue the zones. The blue zones are where people live long lives, healthy lives, and uh, 
Our mutual friend Dan Butner has written extensively about what a blue zone area is and what do they do so that we can emulate that. What do they eat? How do they uh, exercise? How do they move? How do they live in community? So it's never just one thing. I just wanted to Correct. say that. So, But for instance, the Okinawans, some right. of the longest lived yeah. people on earth, 85% of their diet is a purple sweet potato. 85%. About 6% of their diet is rice, but believe it or not, it's not brown rice, it's white rice. Right. And the other is a smattering of pork and some tofu, but the soy they use is actually miso, uh, miso, uh, which is fermented soy. Right. Uh, and one of my favorite stories from La Melinda, the, the favorite food of the Adventists is texturized vegetable protein, uh, TVP. And texturized vegetable protein. And we used it for everything. It, okay. We called it mystery meat. We, there was a wham sandwich, and we had shrimp that were made out of this. And what is that? Well, it's actually defatted soybeans that are extruded under high pressure and high heat. And what the Adventists have figured out is that soybeans are actually really bad for you, the lectins, but if you pressure cook them, which we have a lot of things mm -hmm. in the book about pressure cooking, you'll destroy the lectins in beans. And I think it's really interesting that one of the blue zones has recognized that from... So give me a typical, for people before they go and get this, a typical breakfast. Like, what do you eat for breakfast? Nothing. Next question. Okay, <laughs> that's great. So we're, we're equal right now. Lunch. So lunch, I have a salad. Um, and the purpose of the salad is to get olive oil into my mouth. And right. one of my favorite sayings is the only purpose of food is right. to get olive oil I into your mouth. I remember that very well. And also we talk a lot about the benefits of olive oil to the brain. This Correct. is also I like to always talk about since we talk about preventing the best we can Alzheimer's and what is good for your brain. Olive oil, olive oil, olive oil. So you put olive oil on the salad. Do you eat protein with the salad? No. No. Okay. So, so protein is profoundly overrated. We are proteinaholics. Protein is one of the biggest dangers in our diet. And if you look at the only common factor of all the blue zones, and I think Dan would agree with me about this, they have diverse diets, but the one commonality with all these societies is they eat very minimal animal protein. And it really breaks my heart because I grew up in Omaha and you know beef is king yeah. and pork is king. But animal protein, as I talk about in The Plant Paradox, is a yeah. mischief maker for us in terms of longevity. So let me ask you the salad. What's in the salad other than, you know, kale or Yeah, so lettuce? lots of leaves, different okay. sorts of leaves. In fact, I think the more I can get people to eat um, radicchio or Belgian endive or chicory, uh, the better off they're going to be long term. And I, I talk about this in the upcoming book on longevity. We have to eat to feed the bugs, the microbes that live in our gut. And the more we choose foods for them, the more for they're the actually going to take care of us. So you're going to eat a salad for lunch with lots of olive oil yep. and just lots of different greens. You're not going to put hard-boiled eggs on it. You're not going to put nuts on it. No, I have a handful of nuts every day, about a half a cup. Um, okay. I'm very fond of walnuts, pistachios, macadamia That's nuts. That's a snack or something. That's a snack. If you want to put it on the salad, Okay, so go like I'm ahead. starving. You're having salad with olive starving? oil. Starving? I've got starving. a mixing bowl full of salad. Okay. You know, a gorilla eats 16 pounds of leaves <coughs> every day, and people go, well, where does he get his protein from? They get the protein from leaves. A horse eats grass. That's where they get their protein from. And we're perfectly capable of getting all the protein we need from nuts and leaves and tubers. So we eat the big salad uh, with olive oil, and we don't eat again till dinner? Right. And then what happens at dinner? So dinner, believe it or not, I usually have another big salad. And That's it? Yeah. Oh, if you my God. Wait, this is like, but I mean, most people, they, you can't just eat two salads a day. Why not? Because we're starving. No, we're not starving. You've got to eat a lot of salad. Now, if you want to have oh, tubers, yeah. which I love, so he I'll have. Other than, you have uh, things other than salad in this book. Oh, gosh, book. yeah. There's yes. all, actually very few salads in this book. In this book, what I want to do is have people eat food that they recognize, that they grew up with, but food that you love that loves you back. 
And that's the difference. So, for instance, you're looking at a broccoli cheddar quiche. Right. And this is going to be loaded up with cruciferous vegetables. The cheese is not cheddar cheese. It's actually goat cheddar. And it turns out the type of cow that you use to make cheese makes a huge impact on your health. I particularly loved aged cheeses, and you'll find out in the next book why aged cheeses may actually improve your brain health. Hmm. So, uh, which is really, I think, for so many people, that is beginning to land in the consciousness that, you know, what we eat, we were always told, like, just lose weight, be thin, but it was never a connection to how we think right. or the longevity uh, that we could endure, right? So, what are the best foods, you think, to help you think clearly? Well, you, you already spotted one of them, olive oil, and you right. and I both know the Spanish study where they took 65-year-old people and divide them into three groups for five years. And the original study was to look at memory. They all ate in a Mediterranean diet. It was Spain, after all. The one group had to use a liter of olive oil per week. Now, that's a huge amount. That's 12 to 14 tablespoons a day. And they actually had to bring their bottle into the clinic once a week and exchange it to show that that's what they were doing. Uh The second group had to eat the equivalent calories in raw walnuts. And the third group had to eat equivalent calories but a low-fat Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. And so they followed them for five years. Mm -hmm. At the end of five years, the olive oil group and the walnut group actually had improved memory at age 70 than they did at age 65. The olive oil group was a little bit better, but the walnut group um, did equally as well. The low-fat group, as you would think actually lost memory during those five years. But that's so important because we were, you know, for the last many years we were told low fat, low fat, and now we're like, oops, wrong message, fat, fat. So uh, many people say, well, like, how do I know what he's saying now isn't going to come back to bite me in three years? We're going to go, oh, big mistake to eat all that salad, big mistake to eat all that lettuce, big mistake to eat all that olive oil. Well, so here's the deal. If you, I've been at this for 17 years now. And I've written three books, and interestingly enough, I'm, I evolve what I say, but the basic message has been on point ever since my, my first book. Um, and it's interesting, that we had a, initially a chapter on intermittent fasting, uh-huh. and my editor at Random House said, this is too nutty, there's nobody who's ever going to do this, we're going to cut that out. I said, no, 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 this is really important. She said. I'll give you three pages, and, but you, we don't want you to appear as a nut. Well, <laughs> shortly after that, we learned uh, that our, what I already knew, that intermittent fasting was one of the greatest ways to save your memory, to grow brain cells, and to prolong your life. So speaking of intermittent fasting, do you subscribe to the idea that we should eat everything within an eight-hour period? Do you say we should fast for 14 hours, 12, or 16? Because that seems to be also up in the air. Yeah, I think um, Dale Bredesen, who's become a friend of mine, and I agree that... Wrote the book, The End of Alzheimer's. We've had him on Architects of Change Live several times. So he and I agree several things. Um, We now know that the brain cleans itself every night. It literally goes through a wash cycle. And it does that usually during deep sleep. And deep sleep is usually early on when you first go to sleep. Uh, I have a deep sleep tracker here. And... That, that ring is a deep sleep tracker? And it's a sleep tracker, and it has tons of electrodes. And Does I, that help you sleep, or just No, it you tells you what you did, and w- did you make a mistake. Uh, uh, but I don't need a ring to tell me. So that. we know that when you eat, yeah. when you and I grew up, our mother said, if you're, if you're going to have lunch, you can't go swimming for an hour after you eat mm-hmm. because you'll die of cramps, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Well, that old wives' tale had a bit of truth in it because mm-hmm. when we eat something, all the blood flow is shoved down into our intestines to actually digest the food. It's actually very expensive to digest food. So what happens if we eat, say, at 8 o'clock mm-hmm. and then we go to bed at 10, most of the blood flow that would normally go up to your brain to Mm -hmm. clean your brain Mm -hmm. is still digesting food. 
And so Dr. Bredesen has found, as I've recommended, that you really need a four-hour window before the last meal of the day and before you go to sleep so that when you go to sleep, all of this tremendous blood flow that your brain needs to do this wash cycle right. is available. And one of the biggest mistakes we've made is kind of even having a late night snack before we go to bed. Bad. Now, bad. Bad with the corn. Out yeah. goes the corn. Out, out goes, goes the, the no popcorn. Snack. No popcorn at night. So the other thing... So stop basically eating at like 8 o'clock and then don't eat again until lunchtime. Correct. Yes. And one of the things we've made a horrible mistake Very is sorry. breakfast. Right. You know, our ancestors didn't crawl out of a cave and said, what's for breakfast? We forget there was no storage system. But we're also told that our children can't learn in school unless they have a healthy breakfast. That's coming from the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture's business is to sell agricultural products. It's not looking out for our health. It's so looking out for agriculture. So you think children should not eat breakfast? Children never used to eat breakfast. The French have no word yeah, don't, for don't breakfast. Don't go screaming at me now because people, you know, there's parents who are so they're, really adamant yeah, about so children eating a healthy breakfast. Okay, but the healthy breakfast is certainly not Fruit Loops. Right. Believe it or not, Fruit Loops has the American Heart Association seal of approval on them. Right. And that's the least healthy food. So if you want to feed them, give them millet or sorghum cereal instead of oatmeal. Oatmeal is actually a really bad breakfast for kids. Uh, I talk about in the plant paradox how oatmeal causes cavities in children. A study done in England. So give them sorghum or millet, which don't have any lectins. What are you excited about, Dr. Gundry? What has changed since the plant paradox came out to this cookbook in terms of what we eat, what we know, and what excites you today? So people are beginning to realize that something is really wrong. People haven't been able to put their finger on it. Our health is actually deteriorating. Baby boomers are actually far sicker than our parents were at any particular age. We're on more medications, we have more operations, and that can't be right. And the Gen Xers, my children, will, if something doesn't change, will have a shorter life than baby boomers. That's the prediction. I mean, 50, 60 percent of us are diabetic or pre-diabetic. So the exciting thing is people know what's wrong. They have, and they, they have a they sense, have feeling, and they, they have a feeling that something is wrong with what we're eating. Exactly, and they're making efforts to change it. Yeah, I think people really are starting to say, "What is it about what I'm eating that's doing this?" Or, "What is it with our animals?" One of the things that I think people are beginning to realize that I talk about is, "You are what you eat," but probably equally as important, you are what the thing you're eating ate. And so, so pause a second. You are what the thing you're eating ate. ate. So ex okay. take that down one level. So a chicken right. is supposed to eat bugs. They're insectivores. They're supposed to be pasture. They go out and eat bugs in the field. A chicken is not supposed to eat corn and soybeans. That's not a chicken's diet. So when you're eating a modern, organic, free-range chicken, it's actually been kept in a warehouse. It's never been let outside, and it's been fed <coughs> unnatural things. So that chicken is no longer a chicken. It's actually an ear of corn with feathers. And I, I learned this from my children when I was in... Oh, my God, it's an ear so it, of corn it, with feathers. Oh my gosh, okay. This is actually the truth. So I lived in England in the <laughs> mid-1980s uh, learning gen congenital heart surgery, and my okay. kids were five and seven. And they missed Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they opened a Kentucky Fried Chicken in England. Now, in England in the 80s, there was so much fish that chickens were fed ground-up fish meal. And the flesh of chickens was pale, looked like fish. So we run out to Kentucky Fried Chicken, the girls grab a drumstick, they bite into the drumstick, and they go, Ew, you tricked us, this isn't chicken, this is fish. And I go, no, 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 look, drumstick, see, you know, bone. Mm -hmm. No, it's fish, Oh, you know, you tricked us. They were right. The chicken, because it had been eating fish meal, was a fish, it wasn't a chicken. A chicken that's eating corn and soybeans 
isn't a chicken, even though it looks like it. A cow that's been fed corn and soybean. So even grass-fed cows. So a grass-fed cow that's grass-finished is what it's supposed to eat. So right. that's correct. But you got to be careful. The Department of Agriculture says, hey, if that cow ate grass for one day of its life and then was taken to a field feedlot, perfectly legal to say it was grass-fed because, gosh. So what should people look for? Grass-fed, grass-finished. Grass-fed, <coughs> grass-finished. Free-range chicken, is it? No. No. no just never f- The federal government chicken. passed a law okay, naming free-range chicken. chicken that you could keep it in a warehouse with 100,000 other chickens open a door to the outside five minutes every 24 hours and you can let, let it be called free range. So do you eat any meat at all? Yeah, and, I do. And wild and fish? Yeah. Wild so, fish? Yeah, so I primarily eat wild fish or wild shellfish. Um, for instance, I had some, I was staying at a hotel and I had some octopus and I had some king crab with avocado last night and that was my dinner. No desserts? No. no. Extra dark chocolate. Preferably greater than 72, 80%. I remember you saying to me when we first spoke about the plant paradox diet that when you put people on this diet or this way of living, I should say, Thank you. that for two weeks they hated you. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it switched. So if people are eating this way, they should be prepared for two weeks to be miserable or. No, you probably don't like me very much, but I think with the cookbook, what right. I've been able to do is you'll like me a lot sooner because you're going to have waffles that look and taste like waffles, but they're made out of cassava flour and coconut flour. I showed you a picture of my grandkids eating mint chocolate chip cookies and cramming them down their cute little faces right. that are made out of almond flour and coconut flour, and they're fabulous and delicious and extra dark chocolate and we use sweeteners that aren't going to kill you things like swerve or just like sugar which are made out of inulin which have actually been shown to feed good gut bugs what I don't want to happen is uh, my my friend Jack LaLanne who I got to pick his brain while he was alive Mm -hmm. used to have a favorite saying if it tastes good spit it out right now in a way he was probably right but that's not great dietary advice for all of us who enjoy eating. Mm -hmm. So what I think he was trying to say uh, was the things that don't taste very good or have a lot of bitterness to them and again getting back to the blue zones one of the characteristics of long-lived people is they eat a lot of bitter things and it's these bitter compounds which are called polyphenols that manipulate our bacteria and actually provide amazing compounds for our brain. And I know you and I are passionate about brains Mm -hmm. and particularly women's brains because as you've so pointed out, the vast majority of Alzheimer's happens to women. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think there's several factors in it. Number one, you guys uh, are designed to have babies Mm -hmm. uh, and your immune system actually has to tolerate a rather impressive parasite for nine months and your immune system has to switch from being kind of hyper attentive to things to laying back and relaxing and we see and I, I talk about this in the in the next book that your immune system often attacks your brain Uh, by mistake. And Dale Bredesen and I agreed that what's happening in the brains of Alzheimer's is actually coming from the gut. Mm -hmm. Uh, Giving an example, as you know, beta amyloid is actually produced by bacteria in the gut. And beta amyloid then reaches the brain from the gut. The vast majority. So is it your opinion, and this is something that I've I don't have any scientific proof for it, but obviously women's bodies begin to change, certainly in puberty, right? And then if a woman has a child, women who are perimenopausal, menopausal, that their bodies are so different and the way they kind of go through life is so much like this, that that might have something to do yeah. with Alzheimer's. Yeah, absolutely. And so what should women do? Well, w- speaking of Alzheimer's, we know that women who have an elevated... 
uh, hormone in their in their blood called adiponectin, which I write uh, have written about extensively, have a very increased rate of Alzheimer's. Now, when people look up adiponectin on Google, they say, "Oh, adip adiponectin is a good hormone; it makes you skinny," and yet people with women with elevated adiponectin levels have high levels of Alzheimer's disease. So I started looking at that and started publishing that adiponectin levels that are high mm -hmm. are actually a marker for lectin intolerance. And I published a number of papers asking people to take lectin containing foods those are those little plant proteins mm -hmm. that damage us and our brains and taking them out of their diet and we saw that their inflammation levels dramatically fell and that was actually one of the lead ups to why eating the plant paradox way is the way to go so basically it's uh, you can either read the plant paradox book or you can get this new plant paradox cookbook uh, which will tell you kind of what to eat and how to make what you need to eat so that you can live really lectin free, that yeah. you can think clearer, and but but be prepared that it's not going to be an easy transition, right? It's actually easier than most people think because we're we're swapping out things like, for instance, we'll use cassava flour instead of wheat flour, and for goodness sakes, don't use whole wheat flour people for centuries have been getting the haul off of wheat. I mean, can you imagine the French having a whole wheat croissant for breakfast? And I mean, the Italians now, unfortunately, are having whole wheat pasta on tourist menus, and you know, they, they better put a gun in their head. Uh, it's just, the idea so that we should eat those things is just crazy. It's so interesting, though, but you, you redo the, the food pyramid. Food pyramid. Yeah, so these are whatever, if you're like me and you grew up with completely different uh, information, it really, you do have to really flip yeah. um, everything you were taught, everything you learned, every kind of pattern you had. Yeah, I mean, the Department of Agriculture wants us to have 10 servings of whole grains a day. So a serving is a piece of whole grain bread. Do you really think you're going to have great health by eating 10 do pieces? Do you eat any bread? Uh, no. Unless my walnut bread in here, it's really good. Now, if I cheat, and I cheat only in Europe, because up until this past year, Europe had banned Roundup glyphosate. And glyphosate, as you'll learn about in the book, is one of the big mischief makers in our health. Bayer Corporation bought Monsanto, and Bayer is the largest drug company in Europe. And Bayer now has gotten the EU to allow Roundup. Uh, on crops. So what was quite safe to eat in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. wheat in Europe wasn't sprayed with Roundup, uh, soon will be equally as unsafe uh, in Europe as it is here. So, Okay, well I, I think also we've, we've uh, <laughs> learned about what not to eat. The book can tell you what to eat, but you also I think learned that food and food production is really a political issue. Yes. And um, I think that that's, I always talk about Alzheimer's being a political issue to vote for people who uh, are for uh, NIH funding to cure diseases, um, ask your political people that are running about caregiving policies, but you could also ask about their take on food policies on the Department of Agriculture. And do they in fact have a food policy? And when we talk about climate change, all of these things are connected, right? Yeah. Our food supply, the air we breathe, what we're eating, how we live, how we're sick we're getting. So it's all connected and that message uh, is being put out there by a lot of people like Dr. Gundry who many people say, oh, they're nuts, they're quacks, they're crazy. But in fact, it's very scientifically proven. Uh, a lot of research went into this and certainly you're saving lives and changing, starting with yourself, right? Yeah, I used to be a big fat guy even though I was running 30 miles a week and going to the gym one hour a day and eating a healthy low fat diet and going, why do I, I had, I had migraine headaches when I did little baby heart transplants and don't recommend it. And uh, I had such bad arthritis in my knees that I wore braces on my knees to run and I don't have any arthritis anymore. And I don't have migraines. There you have it right from the mouth of the doctor. <laughs> so thank you. It's so good to see you. Good You'll come back you. again when we're talking about longevity, the plant paradox, the plant paradox cookbook. Have a good weekend eating the food that the doctor recommends. Be careful out there. <laughs>